Right now, the average price of a new car is more than $47,000. That's $10,000 more for a new car than it was before the pandemic. Guess what the average price is for a used car? $29,000. That's almost 40% more than it was one year ago. A used car that normally be priced at five grand is now selling for $8,000 or more. And what used to be $8,000 is now selling at $12,000. In fact, this crazy jump is one of the biggest factors impacting consumer inflation. Inflation climbed to nearly 7% last year, the highest in 40 years. And here's the irony, used cars are supposed to depreciate. So what's going on? Today, we're looking to why car prices are hitting the roof. And it might not be what you think. If you're wanting to buy a car, we'll see. Should you pony up and pay the higher price now, or should you wait for the bubble to burst? Or if you're thinking about selling your existing car, we'll see if you should sell high now and laugh your way to the bank. So hop in and let's get going. Many people are frustrated and wondering why car prices have been skyrocketing. Well, the answer depends on how deep you want to go. On the surface, people say the pandemic disrupted supply chains. Yes, that's true, but there's much more to it than that. And it's all a domino effect. When the pandemic hit, government set restrictions to slow down the viral spread. This caused many car makers to suspend car production. Actually, it was more like a screeching halt. And I'm not exaggerating. If you look at U.S. car production in February 2020 and compare it to production levels in April, it plummeted at 99%. That's just in two months. It's like the assembly line just stopped. All in all, in the U.S. alone, car production sank 23% in 2020. The various lockdown measures also changed the American culture. The restrictions meant that people were more homebound and had fewer places to visit. We all remember seeing the news footage of the empty streets of New York, LA, and Chicago. They look like scenes from an apocalyptic movie, but this time it was for real. It was eerie. Well, as can be expected, new car sales took a nosedive. Since people weren't buying new cars, this meant they had no reason to sell their existing cars. So the used car market saw decline in supply too. In addition, being shut in caused more people to work remotely from home. This caused the demand for laptops and computer monitors to jump. So now many semiconductor companies started making less chips for cars and diverting most of their attention to supply the computer and consumer electronics industries. Then America started seeing a mass urban exodus, especially in New York City and San Francisco. Reasons varied. Some people retreated to smaller towns or suburbs out of health concerns. Others lost their jobs and had to move out. Still others started to get claustrophobic in densely populated areas or didn't want to take public transportation or ride share anymore. For example, in New York City in 2020, there was a 36% increase in people leaving the city compared to the pre-pandemic days. The thing is, when you leave the city, you have less public transportation options, so you most likely need to have your own car. But on top of all that, interest rates on car loans hit rock bottom. All this shows that people started to shop for cars again, and America started to see an uptick in demand for new cars. Car makers wanted to start back up, but now they face a shortage of parts and components, not to mention shipment delays. One of their biggest roadblocks is semiconductors. The chip companies can't produce quickly enough. The shortage of computer chips is one of the key factors limiting car production levels. Let's talk about semiconductor chips. Did you know that newer cars require hundreds, up to a thousand semiconductors? conductor chips. We normally think of a car as a mechanical device, but it's more like a moving computer these days. Newer cars are tech savvy and semiconductor chips are necessary for the ignition, brakes, seats, radios, and other electronic parts. Semiconductor chips are tiny for sure, but they have a huge impact on the car industry. With the reduced chip supply, chip prices have skyrocketed. In fact, the media calls it chipflation, and this has been a huge reason behind the rising cost of cars and also of consumer electronics. Last year, the semiconductor chip shortage cost the global car market some $210 billion in lost revenue. For now, as a workaround, many car makers are adapting to the current chip situation by removing car features that require chips. For example, GM said it may suspend heated and ventilated seat in some models and possibly retrofit these features later on when chip supplies become more available. Chevrolet has been making it Silverado without its fuel tracking system, and they may remove the Super Cruiser driver assist 
assistant feature from the Chevy Bolt. Stellantis has been outputting cars without its blind spot detection feature. Tesla removed the lumbar support feature from their seats. Jeep, Dodge, and Mercedes-Benz are also planning to roll out cars without all the features, also with the intent to retrofit these components later. On the other hand, Toyota, Subaru, Mazda, and Nissan stated that they won't limit the features of their cars. They have a huge upper hand because they already have a stockpile of semiconductors or have stronger relationships with chip manufacturers. So their car production, while lower than normal, has been a bit more consistent than many other brands. But it's not just about cutting high-tech features. Car makers are not forced to prioritize which car models to produce, and that makes sense. Look, if you're a baker and you have just a limited amount of certain key ingredient, you're going to use it all to make the product that gives you the highest profit. Why waste it on a less popular product that gives you less in return? From a business perspective, that's smart. But what that means for the consumer is, if your favorite car is less popular model, it might get caught. Take, for example, the Chevy Malibu. Chevy decided to drop that line so they can prioritize the chip to make more popular and best-selling Tahoes instead. So, based on the SUV versus sedan, over this last decade, we can expect to see more SUVs and much less sedans. But there's the thing. Car makers are getting creative and finding ways to work around the chip shortage. That's all great, except that we, as consumers, are the ones who are paying for it all. It's not so much the car makers themselves, but it's the dealerships. They're marking up the new car prices since there's a limited supply of new cars, and they know that those who can pay a bit extra will pony up. So, when will the chip shortage stop? As with many things, there are various opinions and estimates. One major chip supplier called Bosch believes it could be well into this year. I'm more conservative on this one. I wouldn't be surprised if it's more like next year. Because it turns out the problem isn't the chip makers themselves. Instead, it's the supply chain that makes these little chips. They're delayed too. How deep does this rabbit hole get? Some large chip makers in the US and Europe are already expanding their manufacturing capabilities. Chip giants in Korea and Taiwan are also expanding capacity over the next few years. All this should explain why the price of new and used cars is hitting the roof. Here's the obvious question on everyone's mind. If you're wanting to buy a new or used car, should you pony up and pay the higher price now? Or should you wait for the bubble to burst? Or if you're thinking of selling your existing car, should you sell high now or not? Look, it depends on your situation. The fact of the matter is right now it's a seller's market. So, if you have a primary car and you're thinking of offloading a spare car that you really don't need yet, it's a great time to sell now. If I were you, I'd go for it and laugh my way all the way to the bank. But if the car you want to sell isn't a spare car, but your primary car that you just want to upgrade, well, consider this. Even if you're able to sell your car at a high price, you'll likely pay more for your replacement car. So you have to ask yourself, how does that really benefit you? In this case, I'd hang on to the car until the market stabilizes next year or so. Because look, at some point, chip production will catch up with car demand. The thing with bubbles is, at some point, they all have to burst. But now, let's say you wrecked your car and you have to replace it. Well, I wouldn't pay for my dream car now in this market. Instead, I'd take a stopgap approach. I'd get the cheapest, most reasonable car for now. Hang on to it for a couple of years or so. Hopefully, by then, the market will normalize, and at that point, I'd sell the interim car and get a more ideal one. In other words, think of it as a bridge of sorts. But now, if you're someone with extra cash to buy a new car without blinking, even at a higher price, then the question is, are you okay with a car that's missing top-notch high-tech features due to the chip shortage? If so, well then, it's your prerogative. Personally, I myself am not a fan of certain new features, so depending on what feature you cut, maybe it's not such a sacrifice. Either way, it would behoove you to see what features got cut. But if you're an early tech adapter type of person, then you'll probably want to wait until you can get the full feature set that's normally available for the specific model you have in mind. If you want to put this all into perspective, just look at the inflation rate. Normally, inflation happens because of economic recovery, supply chain disruptions, even weather changes since it impacts the supply of commodities like raw materials. The U.S. Federal Reserve normally tries to fence inflation rates at around 2%, but last year, U.S. Consumer Price Index wrote 7%. And that's the fastest in the last 40 years. If you think food prices are getting high, yes, they are. And if you haven't already followed the news, they say the price of chicken will get even more expensive. And look at gas prices. Now compare it with car prices. Economists say that a little bit of inflation is a good thing. It's a sign of a healthy economy. But who knows where the tipping point lies. But now, you tell me, have you recently bought a car? How much did you overpay? And are you satisfied? 
Or are you shopping for a car? How's the shopping experience in this market? Please share by commenting below. If you like this episode, please like and subscribe. Thanks for your support.